So we're going to get right into the message here. If you'd like to open up to the book of Hebrews as we're continuing uh, to wrap up this last final chapter in Hebrews. We're in Hebrews chapter 13 and we are back in verse 4 again. And this is the third message on this subject and this will be the last message here and then we'll move on. But um, this is a third message uh, along the subject of sexual purity. So this is sexual purity part three. I encourage you to listen to parts one and two. They are online if you weren't here to hear them so that you could kind of track with us here. But uh, tonight's message uh, is the third and final message on this subject of sexual purity in Hebrews 13.4. And the t- subtitle is adulterers God will judge looking at the subject of adultery and what God has to say about adultery in the New Testament and also uh, back in the Old Testament so Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 4 again says marriage is honorable among all and the marriage bed is undefiled but fornicators and adulterers God will judge So, um, marriage is honorable. Marriage is a very natural thing. Marriage is a very healthy thing. Unless you're called to be a eunuch, you're probably called to get married at some point. Some may have been married and then uh, they may be widows or widowers. Some uh, perhaps have have gone through a divorce, have an unbelieving spouse that has abandoned you and and left you, or or perhaps... uh, spouse that cheated on you and left you for somebody else and you find yourself unmarried uh and 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 that's okay too whatever state you find yourself in married or single the bible says just serve the lord in that condition if you're single be happy to be single and serve the lord uh first and foremost put him first make your concern the things of god uh, because you're not caught up with the burdens and the cares uh, uh, of a spouse if you're married, then you put your spouse ahead of everybody else. Uh, you concern yourself with the needs of your spouse and of your family as a wife for the husband, as a husband for the wife. This is from 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Um, but marriage is a good thing. Marriage is honorable. It was God's idea. It's a very natural thing to want to marry. It's a very healthy thing to want to marry. Uh, and it's not good for the man to be alone. So the marriage uh, is honorable uh, among all. And the marriage bed is undefiled. It it's, uh, tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, just as a reminder, we looked at this uh, earlier, that it's good for a man, it says, not to touch a woman. In other words, if she's not your wife, you shouldn't be touching her sexually. Or if he's not your husband, you shouldn't be touching him sexually. Uh, 1 Corinthians 7, 1. Now concerning the things of which you wrote to me, Paul says, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Unless it's your wife, then it's good for you to touch your wife and for your wife to touch her husband. But if she's not your wife, you shouldn't be touching her in that way, uh, he's saying. But he says, nevertheless, because of sexual immorality, let each man have his own wife, let each woman have her own husband. So that is uh, God's idea for marriage. One man, one woman in a covenant relationship uh, for life, for till death do us part in a monogamous heterosexual relationship. Marriage uh, is God's idea, and it's honorable among all. But we also read that the second part of verse 4 is fornicators and adulterers God will judge. Now, last message, last Wednesday night, we looked at the idea of fornication. And of course, it's the Greek word porneo or pornos, from which we get the English word pornography. And so anybody who is practicing pornography, looking at pornography, getting sexually stimulated, uh, self-pleasuring with pornography, the Bible says here that that is something that God is going to judge. It's very serious, uh, sexual purity among God's people. And so he says fornicators, those who practice pornos or porneo, uh, which is pornography, it's also sexual immorality, which is sex Outside of marriage, sex with somebody other than your spouse, it says God is going to judge. And so we looked at that again uh, last Wednesday night. I encourage you to uh, go back and listen to that message if you were not here about the severity of Christians practicing porneo or practicing sexual immorality. We're having sex outside of marriage. It's a very serious thing to God. But even, even more serious, I would say, to God is adultery. 
It says adulterers God will judge. The Greek word for adultery is moikalis. Uh, the Hebrew word is naaf. And it, it basically, in the Greek or in the Hebrew, just translate is, the word is just translated as adultery. So this is specifically when someone is sleeping with someone that, uh, other than their own spouse, sexually sleeping with someone who is uh, not your spouse, um, or, or uh, you're sleeping with someone else's spouse. It's very clear. This is not very complicated. Pornos has a whole bunch of different words that define it and different sexual acts that kind of fall under the uh, pornos um, um, warning uh, for fornicators, God will judge. But adultery is, is, is very simple. It's sex uh, with someone other than your spouse or sex with someone else's spouse. It's not okay with God. It's never okay with God. And it is something that God is deadly serious about. As a matter of fact, when we go back and read, this is in the New Testament, we go back and read in 1 Corinthians in chapter 6. Paul the Apostle says this in verse 9, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? So he's saying, listen up, those who are unrighteous are not going to heaven. And then he's going to list what he defines as the practice of an unrighteous lifestyle or a godless lifestyle or a wicked lifestyle. And then he says, do not be deceived. This is to the Christians. This is to the church. This is to you and I. He's not talking to unbelievers here, to the world. He's talking to Christians. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God, will not go to heaven? And then he says, do not be deceived. So he doesn't want us to be deceived about this. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. So that's those who claim to be Christians who are practicing these sins as a lifestyle. Not that you slip and fall into sin. Not that sometimes, you know, you, you, you're tempted and you sin and you repent of it. That's, that's the, 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 the battle between the flesh uh, and the spirit that, that we are now engaged in. Galatians 5 tells us the flesh wars against the spirit, the spirit wars against the flesh, and whatever you feed is going to go stronger. He's not talking about our struggles with sin. What he's talking about is a lifestyle. And the first uh, three that he mentions, fornicators, idolaters, and adulterers, and then homosexuals and sodomites. So he's really talking about sexual sin. Idolatry is thrown in here because idolatry is a form of sexual adultery uh, in, in God's eyes. If you are, you know, worshiping other gods or going after other gods, practicing idolatry or witchcraft or sorcery or, you know, uh, other religions and going after other gods, God considers idolatry as adultery because basically you're married to Christ, you're uh, uh, engaged to Jesus in the sense that, you know, we're betrothed to Jesus as his bride and he is our bridegroom. And so if we go after other gods, we're committing spiritual adultery. But it's interesting that the first five things that are listed here are related to sexual sin that he says, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Those who practice fornication, por pornos, or adultery uh, will not inherit the kingdom of God, including drunkards and revilers and thieves and covetous and, and, and the rest. And so God is, is very serious about this. But then he says in verse 11, he says, but such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the spirit of our God. So it's really not talking about condemning you for your past, because if we all got condemned for our past, what we did before we were saved or things that maybe we did, you know, even early in our, uh, in our Christian walk that, that, that is regrettable lifestyle choices, or maybe we were practicing sins because we weren't quite convicted yet, or we weren't quite mature enough yet to really understand the severity of this before God. God's not talking about making you feel guilty about your past sins. He says, such were some of you, but you came out of that lifestyle. You've been washed, you've been clean, you've been sanctified, you've been justified. But if you think you could go and live a life of pornography, or a life of fornication, or a life of homosexuality, or a life of practicing adultery, and think that you're going to go to heaven, the Bible says, don't be deceived. Those who practice this 
will not go to the kingdom of heaven, will not enter the kingdom of heaven. It's very, very serious. This is the New Testament. This is under grace. God is still warning us against the severity of these sins. In Galatians chapter 5, in verse 19, we read this about the works of the flesh. Now, the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, and revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in times past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. So a second time in the New Testament, really it's a third time because we already read in Hebrews 13, 4 that fornicators and adulterers God will judge the New Testament. So this is a third time. Uh, let everything be established by the mouth of two or three witnesses that God says you cannot practice these sins as a habitual practice as Christians and think that you are going to heaven. Now, God is merciful. God will forgive you, but you have to repent of your sins, agree with God, confess that, you know, I'm, I, I'm, I'm living the way I shouldn't be. I'm living a lifestyle I shouldn't be living. I, I repent of it. I forsake it. I'm turning away from it, I confess it, and let God forgive you, and let him heal you, let him wash you, and let him free you from uh, these uh, sins that are listed here. But we cannot deceive ourselves in thinking that if we're practicing these sins, and the first one that's mentioned in this list, and it's a longer list really than, uh, than, than 1 Corinthians 6, 9, and 10, uh, there's, there's a few more things included here that are uh, prohibited for us as practice. The first thing is adultery. And so God is, is very serious about sexual sin. Adultery, fornication, which is again porneo, uh, uncleanness and lewdness, those first four things are all sexual sins. And God says, be warned, be aware, those who practice these things will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. And, and the first thing listed on that list of prohibitive, prohibitive uh, actions would be adultery. Now, Jesus tells us that adultery is actually, just like uh, so much of, of the sins that we practice, adultery is a sin that comes uh, and originates from the heart and then comes out of the heart. We read in Matthew in chapter 15 and verse 18, Jesus says this. He says, those things which proceed out of the mouth come from the heart and they defile a man. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man. But to eat with unwashed hands does not defile a man. So Jesus is telling us that, that even adultery comes out of our heart, that, that we sin first in our heart and in our mind in the thought realm, and then we act upon the thought. But, but these sins start with the thought realm, with the heart realm. And Jesus is saying that out of the heart proceed all of these things. We can't trust our hearts. You can't follow your heart. Your heart is, is wicked and deceitful and not to be trusted, according to Jeremiah chapter 17. Who can know it, Jeremiah says. The heart is so deceived and deceitful. And apart from Christ and apart from the Holy Spirit, our hearts are wicked. We can't trust our own hearts. We have to trust the Spirit of God and the Word of God. And so, so often, adultery is a heart issue, because we're going to be focusing here on adultery in this message. It's the idea of lusting for something that doesn't belong to you, someone else's wife. It's the idea of coveting something that doesn't belong to you, someone else's husband. It's the idea of not being satisfied with your own spouse that God has given to you if you are married. And so it is a heart issue. It's not being satisfied with that which you have and not making the best of the relationship that you have, thinking the grass is greener or thinking you can get away with it or whatever. Uh, and it is, according to Jesus, a very serious thing, and it is uh, an issue of the heart. Oftentimes, those who practice adultery are very prideful people. They think they are the exception to the rule, or somehow they think that they should be allowed to do this for whatever reason. And, and so often, the root sin uh, of adultery begins with pride, very, very often. In Matthew, in chapter 5, 
in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus tells us this. And some of this is a little bit repetitive. We've looked at some of these verses before in the prior messages, but they, they, they apply here. Jesus says in Matthew 5, 27 in the Sermon on the Mount, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So again, it's a heart issue. This adultery begins in the heart. Looking at someone lustfully, looking at someone and then acting uh, upon that lust. He says, if your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you, for it's more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. If your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you, for it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. So Jesus is establishing the law, which says you shall not commit adultery. As a matter of fact, it is the seventh commandment of the Ten Commandments. Uh, the sixth commandment is thou shalt not murder. The seventh commandment is thou shalt not commit adultery. But Jesus is taking it one step further. Jesus is saying that whoever looks upon a woman with lust, or whoever looks, as a woman looks upon a man with lust, has already committed adultery. He's already fantasized the whole you know, thing in his head or in her head. And, and, and Jesus says, is most likely speaking about the practice of pornography here, uh, if your right hand causes you to sin, pluck it out. Uh, you know, and if your right uh, eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. If your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off. So whatever it is that is causing this sexual uh, sin or the sexual you know, frustration that you're, you, know, you feel like uh, somehow this is something you have to do or this is something you can't help but doing. Jesus says, whatever it is that's tempting you, cut it out of your life. Cut off the relationship if it's causing you to sin. Get rid of your cable if you can't, you know, handle what, having cable TV or get rid of your, your, your phone or, or whatever it is or get help. Get into some addiction therapy. Go into a counseling session. Talk to somebody. If you're struggling with sexual addiction, especially pornography. I remember talking to a guy who was, uh, I was teaching at a men's retreat up in uh, Tehachapi one year and there was a guy that uh, after I taught uh, up there at this men's retreat and I was driving back down because I had church the next morning and it was a Saturday night and this guy was, was there uh, up at Tatchby Mountain Park and his car was dead, his battery was dead and uh, he was going to walk all the way back into town some 15 miles or something and so I stopped and, and gave this guy a ride and uh, we had <clears throat> a great conversation driving him down the hill and shared his testimony with me and so forth. But, you know, he was, he was a drug addict. He was a, a methamphetamine addict. And, you know, he'd been in and out of rehabs and all the rest. And he had grown up in church and walked away from the Lord and everything and pretty much shared his whole life story with me. But he told me that even more addictive than the methamphetamine was pornography that he said that he got into pornography when he was a teenager and that he was haunted by the pornographic images because obviously he was still using drugs also and then people that use meth, they stay up for four, five, six days at a time. They can't sleep. They begin to hallucinate. And he told me that he can't get rid of the images every time he closed his eyes. He was literally tormented by the images of the pornographic things that he had watched. Uh, and, and it's a very, very... Uh, addicting thing for people to get hooked on pornography and some people uh, they need uh, help and there, there, there are ministries out there to help you with that if that's something you're struggling with but um, if your eye causes you to sin pluck it out if your hand causes you got to get serious about these things Jesus says because uh, God is deadly serious uh, about sexual sin and about adultery in Job chapter 31 and verse 1 Job the, the righteous man of God says this, and this is a, a, a scripture that uh, really we should all have memorized and we should all know where it is in our Bible, especially the men who are here, because men are often sh struggling with lust and stumbling with, 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 with having lustful thoughts and so forth. Job 31.1, he says, I have made a covenant with my eyes. Why then shall I look upon a young woman? And the idea that Job is referring to here is the idea of looking lustfully upon a, a woman that is not his own wife, like a young maiden. And, and Job says as a righteous man of God, really uh, a man that God was bragging about his righteousness to, to Satan earlier in Job chapter 1 and Job chapter 2, 
Job says, I have made a covenant with my eyes. And that's what we have to do. We have to make a covenant with our eyes that we will not look and then begin to fantasize or, or imagine what it would be like to be with uh, someone sexually. And, and so the Bible doesn't shy away from these subjects. God has a lot to say uh, uh, about all of this. In Exodus chapter 20, <clears throat> we read this. This is where God gave the Ten Commandments to Moses and, and then to uh, the nation of Israel. Job, cha- I'm sorry, Exodus chapter 20 and verse 13 says this. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. In verse 17, you shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that is your neighbor's. There were two tablets uh, of stone that God wrote uh, on, upon, with the finger of God up on Mount Sinai, giving the Ten Commandments. The first four commandments were related to, in the first tablet, written on the front and the back, were related to man's relationship with God. You shall, I am the Lord your God, shall have no other gods before me. The first commandment, you shall not make any graven image to worship it. The second commandment, third commandment, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. We should not blaspheme as God's people, his name. The fourth commandment is you honor the Sabbath day to keep it holy. You set one day out of seven apart. We're not under the bondage. This is to the nation of Israel. We are not required to worship on the Sabbath day. Paul says one man uh, honors one day above another. Another man honors every day alike. We don't have to worship on the Sabbath day, but we should at least set one day aside for God. We typically do it on Sundays. Sometimes we do it Sundays and Wednesdays. Really, we should set time aside for God every day of the week, seven days a week. But those are the first four commandments. That was written by the finger of God on the first tablet of stone. And that was man's relationship with God. The second tablet had the next six commandments, starting with the fifth commandment, which which is you shall honor your father and your mother. So now it's the second tablet of stone was man's relationship with fellow man. The sixth commandment, thou shalt not murder. This is not thou shalt not kill in self-defense or in war or if you're a police officer and you're, you know, uh, in a shootout with a bad guy. That's not what God is talking about. He's talking about premeditated murder, killing somebody, planning to kill somebody and murdering somebody. Thou shalt not murder. The sixth commandment. The seventh commandment, thou shalt not commit adultery. Uh, The eighth commandment, thou shalt not steal. Ninth commandment, you shall not lie or bear false witness against your neighbor. The tenth commandment is you shall not covet anything that your neighbor has. But adultery is right up there with murder. I mean, you have, a, you have murder, thou shalt not murder, and the next thing you have is thou shalt not commit adultery. And God was so deadly serious about the practice of adultery that it was uh, a capital offense. It was death by stoning in this culture. God was that serious about the marriage covenant that if anybody committed adultery and they were caught in the act of adultery, they were to be taken to the city uh, center or outside the gates of the city and they were to be stoned to death in front of everybody to make an example of them uh, as to what happens when you take another man's wife or another man's husband. God was very, very serious, deadly serious about adultery, just like he was about murder. Same with premeditated murder. You were to be taken out and stoned to death. Uh, It was a capital offense uh, in biblical times. In Leviticus chapter 20 and verse 7, Paul the uh, the Apostle, uh, Moses rather says this, consecrate yourselves, Leviticus 20 verse 7, and be holy for I am the Lord your God. And you shall keep my statutes and perform them. I am the Lord who sanctifies you or who makes you holy or who consecrates you. He says, for everyone who curses his father or his mother shall surely be put to death. He has cursed his father or his mother. His blood shall be upon him. So that's breaking the fifth commandment, not just not honoring your father or mother, but you're cursing your father or your mother. They were to take that grown child who was cursing their parents and they were to stone them. Imagine how few teenagers would be left alive today if we were still under the Mosaic law of teenagers cursing their parents. But God was deadly serious about the honor for the the, the parents in, in the culture. Then he says, verse 10, 
the man who commits adultery with another man's wife. He who commits adultery with his neighbor's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. The man who lies with his father's wife has uncovered his father's nakedness. Both of them shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. This would be a man who's sleeping with his stepmother or with his father's wife. He says, if a man lies with his daughter-in-law, both of them shall surely be put to death. They have committed perversion. Their blood shall be upon them. Verse 13, if a man lies with a male... As he lies with the woman. So the practice of homosexuality. Both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. If a man marries a woman and her mother, it is wickedness. They shall be burned with fire, both he and they, that there may be no wickedness among you. Then he says, if a man mates with an animal, bestiality, he shall surely be put to death and you shall kill the animal and if a woman approaches any animal and mates with it you shall kill the woman and the animal they shall surely be put to death their blood is upon them so God was deadly serious about sexual sin especially sexual perversion now if a man slept with a woman and uh, it was found out they weren't stoned to death that man had to marry that woman so if they were sleeping together they were not married and they were you know to anybody else and they were uh, having sexual relations and it was found out they didn't take them and stone them to death what they did is said okay you're already treating this like you're married you need to marry this person and you need to then be responsible if you're going to have sex with somebody then you need to take them as a man you need to take this woman under your roof you need to provide for her and her children you can't just be sleeping around with whoever you want in the scriptures, but adultery, bestiality, homosexuality, incest, these sorts of things were another level of perversion, and the penalty was death. Again, God was deadly serious about sexual sin in the Old Testament. Now, Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter 5, in verse 31 still in the Sermon on the Mount, related to sexual sin, he says this, Furthermore, Matthew 5, 31, it has been said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say that whoever divorces his wife for any reason except sexual immorality causes her to commit adultery. And whoever marries a woman who is divorced commits adultery. So Jesus is even saying uh, the idea of, um, of being able to divorce and remarry unless there is adultery. And then uh, we're going to see here in a minute that Paul the Apostle adds uh, a, an unbeliever abandoning a believing spouse. is also uh, permissible then for that uh, spouse who's been abandoned by an unbeliever to remarry, to be divorced and remarry. But Jesus uh, uh, is basically saying that you can't just decide you don't want to be married to your spouse anymore because you found somebody that you like better. You find a, a younger version uh, and you want to get, you want to, you know, trade in your, your, your older spouse for a younger spouse. You can't just do that. Uh, uh, God is very, very serious about this. In Matthew chapter 19, uh, Jesus says this about marriage and about divorce and so forth and adultery. He says, have you not read that he who made them well, let's, let's back up to uh, Matthew 19, verse 3. The Pharisees came to Jesus, testing him, and saying to him, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for just any reason? In other words, if she burns the eggs and you're mad because your wife burned your breakfast, can you divorce her and remarry somebody else? Or because she didn't do the laundry, or because, you know, whatever silly, dumb reason that somebody came up with that they're going to divorce their spouse because they have their eye on somebody else. They're trying to find a reason why they, why they could divorce and remarry. And they're asking him, can, can a man divorce his wife for just any old reason? And Jesus answered and said to them, have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female? And said, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. So then they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no man tear asunder or let no man separate. 
Then they said to him, Why then did Moses command to give a certificate of divorce and to put her away? And Jesus said to them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, permitted you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning it was not so. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. And whoever marries her who is divorced commits adultery. And his disciples said to him, if such is the case of the man with his wife, it is better not to marry. Jesus raises the bar. He does not lower the bar. God does not want divorce. God hates divorce. He prefers reconciliation. But God does permit divorce and remarriage when there is adultery because adultery, someone cheating on their spouse, is literally murdering that marriage. And and then that spouse, if they uh, cannot forgive and they will not forgive, they are permitted to divorce and to remarry. And, And God permits that and he allows that. But adultery is biblical grounds for divorce, even uh, among the church and among Christianity. There's also another uh, justification, another allowance for divorce and remarriage. Uh, And these are really the only two things in the Bible that really talk to this in the New Testament about divorcing a spouse and and, and remarrying another spouse. And this is, of course, is in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, where Paul the Apostle is talking about this. He says in 1 Corinthians 7, verse 10, Now to the married I command, yet not I but the Lord, a wife is not to depart from her husband. But even if she does depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband. And a husband is not to divorce his wife. But to the rest I, not the Lord says, now Paul is still speaking under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, but basically what he just said in 1 Corinthians 7, verses 10 and 11 is what we just read from the mouth of Jesus in Matthew 5, 31 and 32 and Matthew 19, 3 through 10. So he says, this is what the Lord says. He goes, now this is what I say, and he's now speaking under the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit. So this is God's word to us as well, even though Jesus didn't uh, talk about this. He says, if any brother has a wife who does not believe and she is willing to live with him, let him not divorce her. And a woman who has a husband who does not believe, If he is willing to live with her, let her not divorce him. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but now they are holy. But, verse 15 of 1 Corinthians chapter 7, But if the unbeliever departs, let him or her depart. A brother or sister is not under bondage in such cases. But God has called us to peace. And then he says, for how do you know, O wife, whether you will save your husband? How do you know, O husband, whether you will save your wife? So God hates divorce. It's not his desire. Divorce is not something that God wants ever. God prefers repentance and humility and forgiveness and reconciliation. However, uh, if there's adultery, you are permitted to divorce and remarry. If you are abandoned by an unbelieving spouse, you are permitted to to divorce and remarry and so uh this is the biblical grounds that you have uh uh, adultery or abandonment but we have to remember that that god's will is always you know reconciliation but sometimes it's not possible because it takes two parties to reconcile and if you have one party that wants out uh then it doesn't matter how much the other party wants to reconcile you have two parties and one of them doesn't want to make it work it's not going to work and so god doesn't um you know, uh, ensnare that spouse that you're abandoned by a cheating spouse or you're abandoned by an unbeliever who doesn't want anything to do with you because you're wanting to follow Christ that you can never uh, remarry. That's, that's not scriptural. God does give permission to remarry in the case of adultery or abandonment as we just read. But Malachi 2.16 tells us, for the Lord God of Israel says this, that he hates divorce For it covers one's garment with violence, says the Lord. Therefore, take heed to your spirit that you do not deal treacherously. And really, God was dealing with the divorce that was so rampant in Judaism at the time that people were divorcing their spouses for any old reason just because they wanted a younger 
person. Often it was the older wealthy men who were uh, uh, divorcing their spouses, saying that they weren't taking care of the home or they weren't cooking their meals right and using that as a, to write a certificate of divorce because they really had their eye on some younger girl that they wanted to uh, marry and, and take to bed because they were lusting after them. And God says, no, uh, that, that is not uh, his will. <clears throat> In Proverbs chapter 6, uh, as you read the Proverbs, you see many, many warnings because Solomon was writing this when Solomon was a much younger man and a wiser man. Uh, Solomon was writing this to his son, Rehoboam, and the warnings were there against adultery and sexual immorality. Proverbs chapter 6 and verse 20 says this. Solomon says, My son, keep your father's command and do not forsake the law of your mother. Bind them continually upon your heart. Tie them around your neck. When you roam, they will lead you. When you sleep, they will keep you. And when you awake, they will speak with you. For the commandment is a lamp and the law is a light. Reproofs of instruction are the way of life. So you get into God's word. You learn God's word. You study God's word. You obey God's word. His commandments are light for you and life for you. And he says, to keep you, verse 24, from the evil woman, from the flattering tongue of a seductress. Do not lust after her beauty in your heart, nor let her allure you with her eyelids. For by means of a harlot, a man is reduced to a crust of bread, and an adulteress will prey upon his precious life. Can a man take fire to his bosom and his clothes not be burned? Can one walk on hot coals? And his feet not be seared, so is he who goes into his neighbor's wife. Whoever touches her shall not be innocent. Uh, he says in verse 32, whoever commits adultery with a woman or with a man lacks understanding. He or she who does so destroys his or her own soul. It is self-destructive to commit adultery. He says, wounds and dishonor he will get. His reproach will not be wiped away. For jealousy is a husband's fury. Therefore, he will not spare in the day of vengeance. He will not accept recompense, nor will he be appeased, though you give him many gifts. I mean, it's just nothing but trouble that's going to come out of uh, really sex outside of marriage, but especially adultery. God just uh, takes this so very, very seriously among his people. And then he says in uh, chapter 7 of Proverbs, in verse 1, continuing this thought. He says, My son, keep my words and treasure my commands within you. Keep my commands and live. And my law is the apple of your eye. Bind them on your fingers. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Say to wisdom, you are my sister, and call understanding your nearest kin, that they may keep you from the immoral woman, from the seductress, who flatters with her words. And then he, he tells this story in verse 6. For at the window of my house I looked through my lattice and I saw among the simple, I perceived among the youths, a young man devoid of understanding, passing along the street near her corner, and he took the path to her house in the twilight, in the evening, in the black and dark night. Most crimes, most sins are committed in the blackness and the darkness and the cover of night. He says in verse 10, and there a woman met him with the attire of a harlot and a crafty heart. She was loud and rebellious. Her feet would not stay at home. At times she was outside, at times in the open square, lurking at every corner. So she caught him and she kissed him. And with an impotent face, she said to him, I have peace offerings with me. Today I have paid my vows, so I came out to meet you diligently to seek your face, and I have found you, and I have spread my bed with tapestry, colored coverings of Egyptian linen. I have perfumed my bed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. Come, let us take our fill of love until morning. Let us delight ourselves with love, for my husband is not at home. He has gone on a long journey. He has taken a bag of money with him, and he will come home on the appointed day. With her enticing speech, she caused him to yield. With her flattering lips, she seduced him. 
Immediately he went after her as an ox goes to the slaughter or as a fool to the correction of the stocks till an arrow has struck his liver as a bird hastens to the snare. He did not know that it would cost him his life. Now therefore, listen to me, my children. Pay attention to the words of my mouth. Do not let your heart turn aside to her ways. Do not stray into her paths For she has cast down many wounded, and all who were slain by her were strong men. Her house is the way to hell, descending to the chambers of death. And of course, it could be a man who is seducing a woman just as easily as it could be a woman who is seducing a man. But oftentimes, it seems like men are the big dummies who just go headlong, I guess women could too, Uh, into these affairs and into these adulterous practices and the practice of infidelity for whatever reason, either thinking they're going to get away with it or thinking that nobody's going to know. Look, the Bible says your sin will find you out. You're not hiding it from God. And eventually you're going to have to own your choices. And eventually you're going to have to eat the harvest of the bad seeds, the terrible seeds you planted if you're practicing the sin of adultery. The Bible tells us God will not be mocked. Whatever a man sows, this also shall he reap in Galatians chapter 6. If you sow to the flesh, you're going to reap of the flesh destruction. But if you sow to the Spirit, you'll reap of the Spirit eternal life. None of us are the exception to this rule. And we're going to look at an example of a man of God who fell big time in the area of sexual sin and adultery. uh, None other than David, the man after God's own heart. And so God warns us about the severity of sexual immorality and the dangers of it. And and, and really, you know, those who practice it and and, and think it's okay, uh, the Bible says they're going to find their place in hell. I mean, it's that serious to God. We cannot practice adultery and think that God's ever going to be okay with this. Now, the story in 2 Samuel chapter 11, if you'd like to turn back there, this is just one example, probably the, the most um, you know, severe example in the scriptures that we can look to of the practice of adultery and the consequences that, uh, that, that they paid, uh, David and Bathsheba paid for their adultery. In 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 1, we read this. It happened in the spring of the year at a time when kings go out to battle that david this is king david sent joab joab was his top general and his servants with him and all israel and they destroyed the people of ammon and besieged rabbah but david remained at jerusalem then it happened one evening that david arose from his bed and walked on the roof of the king's house and from the roof he saw a woman bathing and the woman was very beautiful to behold So David sent and inquired about the woman, and somebody said, Is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? Then David sent messengers, and he took her, and she came to him, and he lay with her, for she she was cleansed from her impurity, and she returned to her house, verse 5, and the woman conceived. So she sent and told David and said, I am with child. David, the man after God's own heart. David, the man who God had given uh, uh, the kingdom to him. Uh, He was a shepherd boy. He was following after the sheep. He was the youngest uh, of his uh, seven brothers or his eight brothers. And uh, he was the one that God filled with his spirit to kill uh, the giant Goliath, the Philistine. And David was the captain and the general of Saul's army. And David was the one who God preserved and protected for all those years when King Saul was chasing David around trying to kill him. And David had his mighty men and he was living in the rocks uh, in the mountains like a partridge, he said, being chased around uh, by the, the king of Israel and the armies of Israel. Uh, David, who, who God had given so much to and done so much for, uh, David already had 12 wives at this point. And the question's been asked, well, was God okay with multiple wives and polygamy? No, God was never okay with it, but God permitted it, God allowed it because these people were practicing it almost from the very beginning. They learned this from the pagan nations to have more than one wife. I mean, you see it even with uh, Jacob, who, who, who was Israel, who had the 12 tribes. Jacob had two wives and, and two concubines. Jacob really had four wives. 
But all he did was have trouble in the flesh because he had too many wives. I mean, he, he, he probably would have had trouble keeping one of his wives happy. I mean, Rachel was the one that he really loved, and she was never happy. You know, then he got stuck with Leah, and then he got stuck with, you know, their two concubines or their, their two maidens, and, you know, uh, Bilhah and the other one. And so he has these four wives. He has children from four wives. The four wives are jealous of each other. Then the children are jealous of each other's children. It was just a disaster. It was a mess. If you would ask Jacob, you know, do you regret taking four wives? He would say, don't make the same mistake I, I made. But God permitted it. He allowed it uh, in the Old Testament times. It was never God's intention for more than one man and one woman to be married together, you know, at a time. It was one man from the beginning, Jesus says. God created the male and female, and, and the two will become one flesh. Not the three or the four. A man with two wives or three wives or 12 wives will become one flesh. No, God's intention from the beginning, one man one woman in a monogamous heterosexual relationship for life. That's God's standard. It's his, his ideal. There was polygamy practiced in the Old Testament. God doesn't shy away from it, hide it, uh, or, or, or cover it up. He puts it out there for us to see. And we see all the problems that came as a result for these men who had multiple wives. It was never a peaceful home life uh, for anybody. But David already had 12 wives. And, and, and this time he was actually just going out and taking what he knew to be another man's wife. He's without excuse. David knows the law. He knows what the seventh commandment says. As a matter of fact, David broke uh, at least five, uh, four or five of the ten commandments. I mean, you know, he committed murder. He had Uriah killed. So he committed murder. That's the sixth commandment. He committed adultery first. That's the seventh commandment. Uh, he lied about it. He, or he stole. He stole another man's wife. That's the eighth commandment. He bore false witness. He lied about what he did, so he broke the ninth commandment, and then he coveted another man's wife. So he broke five of the ten commandments, and according to the law, David should have been stoned, actually. Even as the king of Israel, he should have been executed publicly, but God is very, very patient. God is very long-suffering. God is very merciful, and we see a demonstration of God's mercy to David because David was not executed, uh, but David was not above the law, and he broke five of the ten commandments. It started by him looking at another woman with lust, and then he found out this woman is married. She's not single. He should have stopped it right there, but he felt he was prideful. He felt he was empowered. I'm the king. I should have whatever I want, and you know, she's beautiful, and I want her, and he took her, and he slept with her, but he didn't get away with it because she turned out pregnant. David called back Uriah the Hittite from the front lines. Uriah was one of David's mighty men. Uh, Uriah had fought for David when he was being chased by King Saul. He's one of David's 600 mighty men listed. Uh, David knew Uriah. David was friends with Uriah. This was his friend's wife. His friend was out in battle where David should have been. David stayed home. And, and, and David slept with this man's wife. She's pregnant, so David calls Uriah back from the front lines, tries to get Uriah drunk so that Uriah will have sex with his wife Bathsheba so that people might think that the baby actually is Uriah's, not David's. But what happened was is Uriah was a far more righteous man than David was. Uriah says, how can I go sleep with my beautiful wife in my comfortable bed in my beautiful home while you know, the armies of Israel are sleeping under the stars fighting Israel's enemies? And he slept outside of the king's castle. He slept outside at the door on the ground because he didn't feel that it would be right for him to go and sleep with his beautiful wife while his uh, uh, comrades and his fellow soldiers are on the front lines. So David had to come up with a plan B because Uriah would not uh, have sex with Bathsheba. Bathsheba is now early in her pregnancy. David's trying to figure out a plan to cover this thing up. And so David actually writes this execution order and sends it to Joab the general by the hand of Uriah the Hittite. I mean, this is pretty treacherous. David basically tells, your, uh, tells Joab, who's the general in charge of the army, he says, I want you to go up to the walls of the city and attack the city until the battle is hot, and I want you to send Uriah to the front lines while the battle is hot and they're shooting arrows and catapults and spears down on you from the wall of the city. Go and attack it. Uh, there's going to be casualties when you attack a walled city like this, and David knows it. He says, and then when the fighting really heats up, he says, you pull all your soldiers back, but leave Uriah up front. And so basically it was a hit job on 
Uriah. And David literally wrote up the plan, put it in a scroll and sealed it, gave it to Uriah, and Uriah took this scroll to Joab, and Joab executed the plan, and Uriah was killed according to David's premeditated plan. So David is guilty uh, of murdering Uriah the Hittite, who was one of his mighty men, who was uh, a far more righteous man than David was. We read in verse 14 of 2 Samuel 11, In the morning it happened that David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. And he wrote in the letter saying, Set Uriah in the forefront of the hottest battle and retreat from him that he may be struck down and die. So it was, while Joab besieged the city that he assigned Uriah to a place where he knew there were valiant men. Then the men of the city came out and fought with Joab. And some of the people of the servants of David fell, and Uriah the Hittite died also. Then Joab sent and told David all the things concerning the war, and basically told him to tell the king, Uriah is dead. I followed your instructions. So now, David acts like he feels sorry for this poor, beautiful young woman whose husband was just killed in battle. I mean, the treachery just gets deeper and deeper. <clears throat> we read... This in verse 25. Then David said to the messenger, Thus you shall say to Joab, Do not let this thing displease you, for the sword devours one as well as another. In other words, you're going to have casualties in war. Strengthen your attack against the city and overthrow it. So encourage him, was the message back to Joab. And then we read in verse 26. When the wife of Uriah, this is Bathsheba, heard that Uriah, her husband, was dead, she mourned for her husband. And when her mourning was over, David sent and brought her to his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. David thought he got away with it all. He got away with lusting after this woman. He got away with committing adultery with this woman. David was married. She was married. He, she turned out pregnant. He thought he got away with murdering her husband, Uriah the Hittite. It's all closed and clean and sealed. And, but, but what he forgets is that God saw the whole thing. And that's who he should have been most concerned with is displeasing God after all that God had done for him and all that God had given him. So he actually took Bathsheba as quickly as he could to marry her as an, another wife. He already had 12 wives. Now he's going to have 13 wives uh, but, but, you know, uh, he wanted to cover up the sin because really he should have been executed for adultery if anybody found out. And she should have been executed also uh, for adultery. Then we read in chapter 12 how God uh, blows his cover uh, because the Bible says that your sin will find you out. Chapter 12 of 2 Samuel verse 1. The Lord sent Nathan, this is the prophet Nathan, to David. And he came to him and he said, there were two men in one city, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had exceedingly many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb, a little female lamb, which he had bought and nourished. And it grew up together with him and with his children. It ate of his own food and drank from his own cup and lay in his bosom. And it was like a daughter to him. And a traveler came to the rich man who refused to take from his own flock and from his own herd to prepare one for the wayfaring man who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. So David's anger was greatly aroused against the man, verse 5. And he said to Nathan, as the Lord lives, the man who has done this shall surely die. And he shall restore fourfold for the lamb. Because he did this thing and because he had no pity. Then Nathan said to David, you are that man. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel and I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your keeping and gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And if that had been too little... I also would have given you much more. Why have you despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? You have killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword. You have taken his wife to be your wife, and you have killed him with the sword of the people of Ammon. Now, therefore, the sword shall never depart from your house, because you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite, 
to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, verse 11, Behold, I will raise up adversity against you from your own house, and I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor, and he shall lie with your wives in the sight of the sun, for you did it secretly. But I will do this thing before all Israel, before the sun. God gave David space to repent. God gave David time to make this right. And, and David tried to just cover up his sin. And, you know, you, you can't hide from God. Uh, and if God is allowing you uh, in, in, in your life to practice some secret sin, uh, God's calling you to turn from that sin, to repent of it, and, and to bring it to the light. Confess it, repent of it, and forsake it. Don't practice it anymore. And if God's allowing you to get away with it, it's not because God's okay with it. It's because God's giving you space to repent because God is long-suffering and very, very patient with us. But at some point, the judgment will fall. At some point, the hammer will come down. And the judgment, the penalty for sin is so severe. Again, that idea of the sowing of the seeds and then having to eat of that harvest. Uh, whatever you sow, you also will reap. And now God is blowing his covers and God is basically telling him, uh, you did this in secret your wives are going to be taken from your eyes and given to your neighbor in the sight of everyone in the sun. And the sword is never going to depart from your house because you did this thing. David said to Nathan, verse 13, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, the Lord has also put away your sin. You shall not die because David should have been killed. However, because by this deed you have given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, the child also who is born to you shall surely die. So the judgment upon David, who was a godly man, he was a man after God's own heart, but he did something that was very, very wrong, and he got caught. The sword will never depart from his home. You go on to the next chapter. And you read, because remember, David had a bunch of kids from a bunch of different wives, and these kids didn't like each other, and they were jealous of each other. Uh, one of his sons, named Am Amnon, actually raped one of David's daughters. Amnon raped Tamar, and then despised her. And this was, uh, Amnon was David's son, Tamar was David's daughter from two different women, the, Amnon raped Tamar and then wanted nothing to do with her. Tamar's like, if you're going to rape me, then at least marry me, even though I'm your half-sister. And then he hated her. He didn't want anything to do with her after he raped her. Well, then uh, Tamar had a brother, a biological brother with the same mother, uh, who's named Absalom. And Absalom, one of David's other sons, murdered his half-brother Amnon because Amnon raped Tamar, and Tamar was Absalom's sister. That's in chapter 13. So right away you see the damage that was done that David opened the door to the sword in his own household. To say that David had a dysfunctional family is an understatement. He, his family was a mess. His kids were a mess, pretty much all of them, until uh, David and Bathsheba had another son who uh, would be Solomon, who would actually be the son who would inherit uh, the throne. But uh, it's interesting. So the sword will never depart from your home. Uh, Amnon murdered by Absalom. Then Absalom rebelled against David, got an army together and overthrew David and was going to kill his own father, drove David across the Jordan River uh, in, into the area of, of the Jordan. And Absalom declared that he was the king, taking it from his father, King David, and declaring that he was the king over Israel. Uh, and then uh, Absalom went into publicly in the tents of David's wives and concubines. Absalom walked in and slept with David's wives in Jerusalem where, and before God and man. Everybody saw it, even as God predicted would be the case. God said, you took another man's wife in secret thinking you're going to get away with it. Another man's going to take your wives and sleep with them publicly. And that's exactly what happened. In the end, Absalom uh, was killed. Uh, in his rebellion and did not overthrow David. But to say that, you know, uh, again, David suffered greatly it is an understatement because of his adulterous affair with Bathsheba. We see also the baby died. So this child that was conceived, even though the child was innocent, the baby died. Uh, 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 died after being born eight days. It was uh, just not stillborn, but it was only uh, alive for about a week before the baby died. That was also uh, part of, of the consequence here of this sin. Um, and then thirdly, uh, God says, you have given great occasion to the enemies of God to 
blaspheme. And so that's the third consequence for David's sin is that it brought a bad name to God because this is God's man. This is God's king. This is the man after God's own heart. This is David who wrote Psalm 23 and half the book of Psalms for us that they sang the Psalms of David in the temple uh, and, and, or, or in the tabernacle. And, and here David is taking another man's wife, murdering her husband, trying to cover it all up. And then it got out and it was, it was really um, bad for God's name. It blasphemed the name of God among God's enemies. And that was also a consequence for David's sin. How should David have responded? He should have fled once he looked and he saw this naked woman. He should have turned his eyes away like Job. He should have said, I make a covenant with my eyes not to look upon a maid, uh, to, 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 to look upon her sexually. He should have been like Joseph, where Potiphar's wife was trying to seduce Joseph and trying to get Joseph to sleep with her. And Joseph said, how can I do this thing and sin against your husband, my boss, and sin against God? I will not sleep with you. And he fled uh, when she was trying to seduce him. That's what David should have done. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 15, we're told that we are to flee sexual immorality. Do you not know, uh, 1 Corinthians 6, 15, that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take members of Christ and make them members of a harlot? Certainly not. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a harlot is one body with her? For the two, he says, shall become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Verse 18, flee sexual immorality. Every sin that a man does is outside the body, but he who commits, sex, commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. So we're to flee sexual immorality. We're to guard our eyes and guard our hearts and not be lusting after another. In 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 19, Paul the Apostle tells Timothy, this young pastor, he says, Nevertheless, the solid foundation of God stands. Having this seal, the Lord knows those who are his, and let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honor, some for dishonor. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified and useful for the master, prepared for every good work. Verse 22, flee also youthful lusts. But pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. And so he's telling us that we're to be vessels of honor. We're to be vessels that are clean and that are sanctified and consecrated and useful for the Holy Spirit to use. Because our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And, and, and if we're practicing sexual immorality, we're tying God into that. Because whatever you do, God does by some degree because God lives in you. Christ in you, the hope of glory. We're the, the, the temple of the Holy Spirit. And so he says, be sanctified, be clean. Let every, cleanse everyone who names the name of, uh, name of Christ depart from iniquity and flee youthful lust. So when you're tempted, you need to turn and flee. Turn it off. Get away from it. Do not continue to play with sexual sin because in the end, uh, it could very well destroy you. There is a, uh, a book called Torn Asunder, which uh, is, is, a, is, is a very good book. It's written by a pastor named Dave Carter, who was the pastor of um, the EV Free Church for many, many years down in Fullerton, um, back where, uh, where Chuck Swindoll had been the pastor, uh, Evangelical Free Church in Fullerton. And it's all about adultery and the damage that adultery does uh, to a marriage and to the family and to the children uh, and how God, you know, just... just uh, warns against this, uh, you know, uh, what God has joined together, let no man tear asunder, speaking about breaking that marriage vow by committing uh, adultery with someone else's spouse or with someone other than your spouse. Um, now, the good thing is, is that, is that Jesus is, is very merciful and Jesus is very forgiving. In John chapter 8, we have the story of the woman caught in adultery and they wanted to stone her to death according to the law of Moses. We read about that in Leviticus chapter 20. That's what Moses said. But Jesus said, let he who is without sin cast the first stone. And from the oldest to the youngest, these men who are ready to stone this woman who was caught in the very act of adultery, dragged out of bed and thrown at the feet of Jesus, uh, Jesus says, okay, 
Let he who is without sin cast the first stone at her. And one by one, starting from the oldest to the youngest, Jesus started writing something in the sand with his finger. They began to drop the stones and walk away until there was nobody left. Because they all had sins. And probably a lot of them had sexual sins. And maybe Jesus was writing down their names or writing down their sexual sins in the sand. And they thought, wow, Jesus knows everything, even knows my heart. Uh, None of them were without sin. Only Jesus was without sin. Only Jesus could have condemned her to death. But Jesus said, where are your accusers, woman? She says, I don't know. They're gone. He says, neither do I condemn you, but go forth and sin no more. So anybody who's practicing adultery, that would be the message of God for you. You know, turn from it, repent of it, confess it, deal with the consequences of it. At some point, you're going to have to talk to your spouse about it. Pray that your spouse might be forgiving. If they're not, they have biblical grounds to divorce you. And that is part of your cost, part of your penalty for your sin. But Jesus says, go forth and do no more. He forgave this woman that was caught in adultery. He did not condemn her to death. And so the grace and the mercy of God is just magnificent. And then in John chapter 4, you have the woman at the well where Jesus told her, you know, bring me your husband. And she says, I have no husband. And he said, that's true. You've had five husbands and the man you're living with now, you never bothered to marry. And she says, oh, I perceive that you're a prophet. Uh, and so Jesus was telling her, you know, you've got this issue. You know, you're, you're, you're looking for fulfillment with men and with sexual relationships with men. That's why you've had five husbands and you're living with a guy you didn't even bother to marry. And Jesus says, if you'd asked of me, I would have given you living water. You would never thirst again. And, and, and so he tells her, bring me your husband. In other words, when you come to Jesus, whoever it is that you're married to, if they're an unbeliever, if they're a believer, if you've you know, had problems in your marriage, but you come to Christ with your spouse or with the person who should be your spouse, if you're sleeping with somebody, you should marry them, God says, or you shouldn't be sleeping with them. But he says, bring me your husband, bring me your wife, bring this, it doesn't matter if you've been married five times before and gone through five divorces or three times before or however many times before. He's saying, from this point on, bring me your spouse today. Bring this relationship to God. Let God sanctify it and and, and live like a Christian should live. Live as a Christian husband. Live as a Christian wife. And if you're not going to make this person your spouse, then don't have sex with them outside of marriage. Don't cause them to sin and don't continue to walk in sin yourself. You can go back and read after uh, Psalm 51. David pins this beautiful psalm of repentance after he had repented of his sin with Bathsheba and God had forgiven him, although there was stiff penalties that he had to pay. God did forgive David for his sin. And David writes this beautiful song of repentance in Psalm 51. I encourage you to go back and read it. It's a great psalm to actually pray out loud if you're repenting and you're confessing uh, sins to God. And then Psalm 32 is a second psalm that David wrote uh, after he was caught in, in adultery with Bathsheba. And so these are two very poignant and beautiful psalms of repentance that you could employ yourself as well if you have been practicing sexual immorality or adultery. Bottom line is, is that God is very merciful. He's very long-suffering. He, his loving kindness endures forever. But God does hate sin, and adultery is one of the most serious things. And we cannot use God's grace as a license to go out and practice sexual sin as his people. Um, It's just a contradiction uh, for God's people to be living uh, that way. And so that's, you know, this is not a, this series has not been a popular message for our culture today, but it is still the word of God. It's still the truth. It's been here in the Bible for thousands of years. I'm not going to apologize for it. God has not changed his mind just because it's 2022 and, you know, everybody's having sex with everybody else and everybody's, you know, claiming that boys are girls and girls are boys and whatever else. God hasn't changed his mind. God said they're male and female. There's only two genders. God says that we're not to practice homosexuality or sodomy. God says that marriage is to be monogamous between one man and one woman in a committed covenant monogamous heterosexual relationship till death do us part. And God's will is always reconciliation uh, and forgiveness. And God is never going to change his mind about these things. So we just have to come around to biblical thinking and stop thinking uh, like the world when it comes to these issues. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for these examples in the scriptures or the Proverbs to give us the warnings and the story of David and Bathsheba to really uh, warn us about the severity uh, of adultery, Lord, and, and where it could lead.
And, and we thank you for the godly examples of, of Job, who says, I've made a covenant with my eyes. I will not look with lust upon a woman. Uh, of Joseph, who, who fled uh, um, Potiphar's wife, who was trying to seduce him, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that greater is he that is in me than he that is in this world, that we have the power of your Holy Spirit to overcome our flesh, to overcome the temptations of our flesh, and that with every temptation, you provide the way of escape. Thank you, Jesus, that you were, the word says that you were tempted in all ways and yet without sin, Lord God. So you are mindful. You are uh, compassionate with us, Lord God. You are um, just so merciful to us, Lord God, because you lived in this world, Lord. You know all of the temptations that are here that are rampant all around us, Lord, yet you never sin, Lord. And so we have the power through your Holy Spirit, to be victorious over all manner of sin, especially the sexual sins that plague so many. I pray for any who are addicted here to pornography, any who are listening to this message, Lord, who are struggling with sexual sin, sex outside of marriage, adultery or pornography, Lord, or homosexuality, Lord, that you would set them free. He whom the Son sets free is free indeed, Lord God. Just bless everyone, we pray, Lord, to walk in holiness and to walk in righteousness. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.